Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to this very first conversation that Marilyn and I have ever done or shared online. And so what, what is obvious about this being a new experience for both of us is the fact that this is the third medium we've tried tonight. <laughs> so we went from Instagram Live to Facebook to now Zoom, which we'll we'll figure out how to share later and so uh, a lot of gratitude for whoever does end up making the time to sit and and listen to our stories and be a part of this virtual experience uh, today is the national day for truth and reconciliation in canada and my intention for holding this event this evening is to create a space for some deeper listening, some healing, and some possibility. And we do that through experiences of shared humanity and discovering who each other is or are, particularly when it comes to the history of colonization in Canada. And so the intention that I have in setting this up is sharing some of my own story of how I met Marilyn and how getting to know her has opened my own heart and helped me to understand more about the history of the land that I live in and bring more balance into how I reconcile with what is present. I like to start off any of the talks that, um, or we start off our talks typically by doing a little bit of a of a meditation and I'll, I'll do something different tonight because we're virtual what I want to do is encourage everybody that is listening to make a connection with the land that you're living on and with your own ancestors because we're going to talk candidly about trauma and this is something that Marilyn and I have done together many times and we've also done on our own and in order to speak candidly about trauma, it's important that we generate a safe space that helps to hold a container so that we who are speaking feel comfortable in going inwards and you who are listening can trust in your own ability to be in the space that we're generating through our shares. It's really easy to um, want to disassociate or jump out of our bodies when somebody is sharing something that is difficult or challenging because it's so uncomfortable. And so let's generate that space together by closing our eyes and taking a couple of deep and cleansing breaths in. And bringing our own awareness to our physical bodies and the land that we are on. Imagining that we can send roots deep down into the earth below with an exhale. And with an inhale, we can draw some of the medicine from the land up into our bodies. And as we inhale and exhale, imagining that we are connecting with the ancestors who have gone before us, those of our own bloodline and those of the land that we live upon. With each inhale and exhale, we can stretch our energy backwards through time. Hmm. and use our awareness of this to call in the support that we need to guide us in our own individual and collective ways of being with trauma. Hmm. We honor the ancestors who have gone before us those who have stewarded this land for many generations. Those who are within our own DNA. And we ask that there might be an opening inside of each of our hearts to consider the possibility of healing, of peace building, of reconciling. And living in a way that is more in alignment with the land that we live upon. And opening your eyes. So I, I formally would like to invite Marilyn, my my guest here tonight, who's speaking with me is Marilyn Tate Brighteyes. And so Marilyn, I'm really 
grateful for you for taking the time to do this conversation with me tonight and um, and meet the challenges of our technical difficulties together. <laughs> the last time that we did this, we were in person and we were at Boyle Street in Edmonton, Alberta, speaking to, I think, a couple hundred people. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so what I want to share with listeners is the reason why Marilyn has had such a poignant impact on my life. We met in a, under very unusual circumstances. And, and it's through the sharing of this story that I encourage people to find their own capacity to go into what is difficult or challenging in your own lives. And so though Marilyn and I had spoken on the phone or um, through Facebook a few times around 2010, 2011, we met for the first time in 2012. And it was at the Blue Quill Culture Camp that she and I met. I was doing a trauma as medicine talk for the Indian Resolution Health Services Organization. And I think Marilyn, you were there with the kids. You recently moved back to Saddle Lake. And what's really important for me in starting from that particular meeting tonight is that Yes, we were walking the grounds of Blue Quill College, but Blue Quill College was the residential school where your mother and other family members had gone to. And the reason for, for our meeting, for those of you who don't know, Marilyn's brother, Peter Bright Eyes, was the perpetrator who murdered my mother back in December of 1995. My mother's name is Sheila Salter. And so part of the course of my own healing journey had included in time wanting to understand more of who this guy was aside from just being a bad guy. And, and as heinous as the act of my mother's homicide was, I had started to recognize that none of us are 100% defined by our actions. There's always more to who we are. And that curiosity had arisen through some of the healing work that I had done and led me directly to contact Satellite Cree First Nation um, and eventually to contact Marilyn and just saying, hey, I would like to know if possible more about this guy and um, how he ended up being the person hiding in the back of a dark parkade one day um, and capable of committing such a violent act towards my mother. What I had recognized by that point is that, um, you know, somebody doesn't just wake up one day and think, hey, I'm going to go murder somebody. There's going to be a successive amount of trauma that that human being goes through before they get to that moment in time. And I felt like if I could educate myself as to what some of that significant amount of trauma he had gone through was, somehow I, it would A, bring forth healing in my own life, and perhaps be of value in me being of service in our world. Um, most definitely by the time that I met Marilyn, I had spent so much time with um, Eric Large, who was a former chief from Saddle Lake that had invited me to come and do circles and talks there. And he had given me a really profound education in the history of colonization. And, and, and I'm, obviously a, a white woman of and of settler origin. I have ancestors that have um, been in North America since the 1600s uh, in the United States and uh, as well as some that came more recently. but my ancestry stretches back a, you know a pretty far time for a settler. And I thought that I knew about the history of Canada. And you have to think back in 2010, it wasn't, there wasn't as much information as there is now about residential schools or 60s group um, or the Papal Bulls um, or the Doctrine of Discovery. And so in my conversations with Eric, I had a really rude awakening where I got to see that most of my points of view very much came from the, um, the influence of the white privileged overculture where there was this assumption that um, the Indian problem, as it was so often referenced in my childhood, 
had happened a long time ago and they needed to get over it now. And in the time that I spent with Eric, I started to recognize how much the present, how much present day trauma was happening, how recently the residential schools had closed, all of the other systemic traumas that were passed down through the generations, which I was totally ignorant to. And so I set my intention to learn and to let go of any ideas that I might have had or that had come to me through, um, through what I had been taught, whether that was in school or, or um, through our culture, and just to listen. And so by the time I met you, Marilyn, I had already gone through a couple of years of deep listening, but you continue to open me to um, an understanding that, that is very significant. And so what I'd love to invite you to do is to share a little bit about yourself and um, anything that feels poignant about, about meeting each other, what you feel is essential for reconciliation in Canada and how sharing your story acts as a template to guide others. Um, I have been sharing my story since I was um, 14 and um, I was I was given that opportunity through Joe and um, he was the one that, that invited me into a drama group. Before that, I had been silenced all my life. Um, I, I actually just recently um, got my hands on uh, documents from when I, before I went into foster care. Mm -hmm. And that was probably um, a short period of time after my dad left. There was no welfare involvement when he was there because he, he, had, he worked. He was a hard worker and he gave my mom money to pay bills and everything. And it wasn't until after he left that things went downhill. Um, but even during that time, I was, I was still being abused by family members. Mm. Um, I think that one of the things that I, I try to bring home to people and why I share such deep details about my history is because people don't understand the scope of it. There has been through, as even before residential schools, there has been so much trauma in trying to get this land from, from, from First Nations. Um, and the scope of it was horrific. You, you, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the killing of the buffalo, our, our, our main, one of our main food sources that, that was just abundant here. And, and um, dehumanizing First Nations right from the get-go. Um, the, the whole goal was just to have access to this land freely. Um, I think that people, when they see a homeless person, they don't realize the history of that homeless person and the generations of history, like of trauma that, that, that made it possible for this one person to be homeless on his own land, her own land, mm -hmm. to have that, to be at a point where they were not allowed to raise their own children the way they were intended to do since the beginning of time. That had been taken away from us. And it started before the residential schools. The residential schools, they took a lot from us. They took our culture. They took our language. They're taking our old people. There is 
it is being replaced with religion. Religion of a people that have shaped and controlled their own people with their own religion. We didn't want that. I think that um, when, when you showed up, I know that a lot of my family were not wanting to talk to you or your family. Um, there is so much resentment and anger because of all the injustices that they had to survive. And, and not everyone survived. You know, I had an auntie that went to um, Blue Pearls and she never came home. My auntie, I don't know how old she was when she, when she went missing. I don't know where she is. All the records that were out about, about her were destroyed by the priests and nuns before handing over blue pills. There's not even enough information on there about my mom because they burnt those records. And when I look at the records that I got from, from child welfare and, and, and the workers, one of the workers had said that my mom was, was, was um, going from bed to bed, bar to bar. She was made to be aware, like to look like she was a person without principles. And she was, because that's what Canada created. In many of the, the mothers that lost their children, they created it. We didn't. So I had to be open and I had been open all the way from the beginning to share because for, for about the first 14 years of my life, I was silenced. I was so silenced that I never even spoke about the sexual abuse that happened to me when I was in foster care. There's no records of it. At this point, I, I, I can go to the police and I can press charges on him. I'm 48 years old. I was seven when this man took advantage of me and my brother. So when you came, I didn't have no information about my brother, Peter. I didn't remember any of it. I found out, I'm finding out through the records and through other workers that worked at Boyle Street that talked about, that wrote about me. And, and it was like, Anne, Anne was the only one that I remember from, it, from, it, from being a young, young girl who actually really cared. And she was like a social worker, I think. And she's the only one that sticks out because she's the only one that actually really cared. She cared enough to look after me when my mom left to go out and party. And she said she was gonna be back in an hour and she never did. She wrote about what she saw in the home and Peter, Peter was abusive right from the beginning. Um, he was 18 when I was five and there are records of how he treated me and my brother. But I've always said that we weren't born this way. We, we had no choice and we had no chance. So I, I still share, I, I share with my coworkers because um, I work in a lot of times in communities where there are people that have been through what me and my family had been through. 
and they're stuck on the streets, they're homeless. And the racism in Canada and the stereotypes is still prevalent, huge. Like we're in, we're in 2022, how are we still battling this? I don't get it. I do not understand it. And, and, and overseas, they, they, they help people get clean drinking water and food. And we're still struggling in our own lands for, for clean water. I had um, lived on the reserve for a bit and something died in my cistern. And I asked and asked, cause I, I was on welfare and I was a single parent and I was struggling with addiction and I, I needed them to clean that out and they wouldn't do it the last time. And I had black stuff coming out of my taps. My kids were bathing in this. We were washing our clothes in it, our dishes. My daughter, was getting sores on her body because I didn't have a vehicle to go always get a bottle of water. And we lived like that for about a year until the thing finally cleaned out on its own. So we don't have the help, not from the governments, not even from the citizens of Canada. We have stereotypes, we have racism, a whole bunch of bigotry, right? It's like we are dehumanized and we are continue to be dehumanized. And so that's where I come in. I, I, I come in to help. I come in to help people get their IDs, take them shopping. I, I do my best to humanize those that have been dehumanized, like my brother. I can't do that for my family because most of them are dead. They died in their addiction. My other brother, Keith, he, he, was, he was found sitting up in a stairwell. They ruled it an accidental overdose. So when I met you, I didn't, there was no love between me and Peter. There wasn't, you know, and when I, when, when I hear the details of your mother's death, it, 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 it's lately, it's been, you know, hitting me that I survived Peter's, Peter's rape. He raped me when I was 14 by knife point. But the difference between you and my mom, your mom and me, is that I didn't fight. You learn at a young age that you don't fight back. You don't speak up. You do not draw attention to yourself because your life could be taken away. I learned that at six. When I saw my mom get raped, raped beside me in bed, my kids saw that when they watched me get raped. You don't speak up, you don't fight back. Because then maybe you can live long enough to Create a generation that can, without dying, without being murdered and, and uh, being murdered and missing, without being thrown in jail just because they wanted to use their voice, without getting shot in the head because they needed help. You know, like there's so many instances out there. Where, 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 where First Nations have. We are still in a time where Natives, First Nations cannot speak up. And that's the only thing that saved me from Peter was the fact that I did not fight back. And I lived. And it fucked me up. So I, I had no love for him. 
And it was when I, when I started sharing and started talking about my history. Over time, he became human to me. I remember he was my brother. My mom loved him. He was a small baby at one point that just needed someone to love and hold him. But being raised by my mom, there was no love because she never got it when she was growing up. And so the cycle continued up until up, up to my grandparents. And even before that, it took a lot. When I think about it, it took a lot for me to even exist in this world because there are so many families out there that have lost their bloodline before residential schools. They didn't even have a chance. So now, I don't know, someone asked me once if, if I have any hope that things will get better. And I said, no, I don't. We don't have the same opportunities that white people do. Yeah, they're celebrating Indigenous days now. And they're talking finally and they're listening about the children that died in residential schools back in 1951. Like they're finally listening and, and, and hearing it. But that took, that took Canada to find dead children by residential schools. That's what it took for Canada to finally listen. It took the TRC for them to even consider listening, to even bridge, you'd even think about talking about truth and reconciliation because we were just silenced. We weren't allowed to talk. We weren't allowed to hire lawyers. Do you talk about our taxes being paid to us? No, that's not what pays for us. And people don't understand that. And people don't want to. Because they, they, they are, they are still gaining a lot with us under their feet. I don't know how many in our family speak our language. My kids don't. I don't. Yeah, I'm not too sure where I'm going with this. I just know that my job will continue to be relevant and needed till the day I die. Yeah. Well, it, it, it brings to mind for me, um, one of the things I've shared with you many times and that I love about doing a talk with you is how authentic and honest and real you are. And so from that place, if you were to, to say some of the things that have been obvious to you as an indigenous woman that needs to change, be that in our country, in our communities, or for people who haven't thought of it before, what would those things be? I never know how to answer that because there's so much. Yeah. You know, people just need to educate themselves. And they stop, they, they need to stop denying the fact that this happened and 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 like gaslighting us. Right. Or you know, that it's still happening, like you said, that there's that it's still happening now. It is. And 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 the denial of it all or oh, it happened a long time ago. Mm. No, I had two sisters that went to residential school and they went to they didn't go to day school, they went overnight. And it, they were so traumatized that they couldn't even talk about it. 
you know? I don't know, there's so much it, and it's like, I know that for me, like one of the things that I've noticed is that there are a lot of programs out there that are for Aboriginal people. Um, when you look at where like Boyle Street or, or inner city even, um, some of the places I've worked here where 80% of the, of the people that they work for or work with are, are Aboriginal. But the amount of people that are in these services that are providing these services is like 5% Aboriginal based. Mm -hmm. Like, how is that possible? How are, how are they not making it so that at least 50% of, of the employees are First Nations? If, mm -hmm. if the majority of them are First Nations, you know, I know that wherever it is that I work as a First Nations, I'm welcome there. I'm welcomed by, by First Nations. And I'm also welcomed by majority members, not, not Caucasian, everyone else. I can sit and I can talk and I can have these discussions about residential schools, about the history. And they always wanna know more, you know? Um, in the job that I'm in, um, a majority of the night, night staff are, are, are non-Caucasians, and I always feel welcome. Mm -hmm. I always feel like, oh, you have to go home? Can't you just stay another hour? And I'm like, no, I'm not allowed over time, but thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and and, it, and they, there's a lot of agreement that a lot of it, you know, a lot of things need to change uh, that First Nations are getting the, the bad end of the stick, right? And something you and I have spoken about before is that white fragility piece. As you bring it up, you talk about the history and about um, the potential for making amends or considering reconciliation in a group of people who are mostly of white settler origin and there's a lot of offense. People take things so personally and it's like they can't listen um, and even contemplate that there could be a story behind what they have stereotyped. Yeah. And, yeah, I think and they, some yeah. of it is they don't want to, they don't want to imagine that their own ancestors could have had anything to do with that. Well, even that, even that, like if they, if they want to say, well, okay, so maybe my ancestors did, but that wasn't me. Right, right. But there's still, there's still, um, there's still gaining. Yeah. Right. I mean, like one of the things that I had noticed everywhere I go, everywhere I go, when you look in the billboards and when you look up in, you know, when you go to the mall, anywhere you go, you see, um, what do you call those models that, that, that are Caucasian, they're, they're Oriental, they're Chinese, they're, they're, they're African-American. How many natives do you see represented there? Hmm. Representation hmm. matters, you know? When Disney came out with that uh, Black Ariel, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of backlash, but then the, the kids are like, wow, she's got my skin color. But how much representation is there out there for First Nations? This is our land. How is it that we are still underrepresented in anything? You know, um, I know that in, in this area here, we do have Carrier Sakani. They are really big here. Um, Carrier Sakani is like, um, it's like an umbrella of, of about 12 different reserves or 12 different bands in the area of Prince George. And, um, and, and they're there to help the people of, that, of those bands. Um, it's almost like in Sad Lake in Edmonton, but it's like uh, they ha actually have a lot of offices here that are Kerry Sakani. I've been to like five different offices in this, in this Prince George here. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the cool things. But other than that, 
you know, I don't, I don't see much Native representation. Trying to find an elder to come and help and, and share the stories of this land is difficult. Um, I, I see that there's a lot of Cree, you know, um, there's so much that I keep hearing there's a Cree behind every tree. And, and it's funny, you know, and it's true because everywhere I've been through in BC, I, I've met a Cree person, you know, and, and, and it's not just me and my kids. And, and I, I find that interesting because um, our, our band is big. Um, I just didn't realize that we're like all spread out all over the place, but so are our teachings, right? And I, I've, I've been hard pressed to try to find carrier teachings here, carrier knowledge, um, trying to find people that, that can teach the language, you know, it's just, um, I, I've been asking. And like I said, there's so much, unrep uh, un like, there's not enough natives out there that are being invited into the workspace. Um, where I work, there's like about 80% of the tenants are, are First Nations. And um, one Aboriginal is on worker, but they have five CLBC clients, tenants, and four CLBC workers. I mean, does that make any sense? I don't think so. You know, um, there's something wrong here and, and it's not adding up. So um, my job is to touch base with, um, with all the tenants that are First Nations. Um, I'm busy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually, I, like I am actually really busy when I'm at work during the day. And, and the funny thing is, is that they caught me coming in the evenings because they want me to do programming. Um, I'm supposed I'm supposed to do sharing circles. You can't do sharing circles with people who are intoxicated and high, but you can do AA meetings, but they won't let me do that. Hmm. So hmm. it's like come work in here, but you gotta have your hands tied behind your back while you do it. You know? Well, it makes me think of something that you said a little bit earlier in the talk, and then I've heard you mention before that's really poignant. Um, and it's about when you see that homeless person on the street, that person has a story. And so maybe one of the most important acts that any person living in Canada can do is start to investigate what is the story behind this? Much in the same way as I wanted to know what was the story of the, the bad guy in the parkade that day? Like each person has a story. And if we are going to create healing within Canada and bring awareness to the history of colonization that is still present, then we have to investigate what those stories are. So maybe that is uh, a takeaway for anybody watching who might think, oh, I, you know, I need something to do. And, and what can that thing be? And it start to be conscious and start to recognize, particularly if for those that come from the more privileged aspect of the culture to notice you're privileged and then use that privilege to do something uh, to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, if you do come to, to that, it, it's gotta not be like um, a hero role. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because a lot of people, they go in to help and they're like Batman, Superman, right. I'm here to save you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I saw that in that teacher I used to work with, where I, who I'd go to Peru with. And that's how she was with a nonprofit organization. She ran supporting Indigenous people in the high Andes. Like once I went there with her a few times, I'm like, just a second, this is a savior complex. Yes. This white woman helping Indigenous people um, to fix them. Yeah. Oftentimes, they know, like, the, the those on the streets, they know what they want. They know what they need. Um, they just need someone to listen. Hmm. You know? And that's what I do. I, I'm, I, 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 can, I can help them. Um, but a lot of times, what I'm doing is I'm listening to them. Hmm. You know, when I'm taking them shopping, I'm, I'm hearing their stories. And, and these are things that they have been silenced about. 
Mm-hmm. They, they weren't allowed to talk about. They've been working so hard to cope with. And, and there's, you know, I, I thought growing up that I had the worst story, you know. But when I listen to some of these people that I meet fresh from the streets that have been there for a long time, I hear their stories and, and it makes me want to cry. Um, and, and they like that. They like to know that you listen to them, that you laugh with them, you know, that you're not sitting there judging them or, or, or trying to talk about them behind their backs when, when, you know, after you're done listening and feeling all good about it. Because I see a lot of that. I see a lot of that. They'll be, oh, I'm, you know, that, that, um, that niceness, that poisonous niceness where you act all nice. And people, you know, they see through that. Yeah. The, people don't understand that. But when, you're, when, you, when you grow up on the streets and you grow up in this hell, you see through that. And you know that once they're behind doors, they're going to be talking shit about you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They know the authentic niceness. And, and, and it's those ones that will share their story. When they meet a person like that, they will share their story. They will share not just their, their sadness, they will share their laughter, you know? And that's what I like. I like to be able to get all of it. Um, not just the horror stories, but the laughter. Because for us, for First Nations, we use a lot of humor. You know, we laugh at ourselves. We joke about each other. We can put each other down. And most times, if it's if it's not too bad, you know, we're not going to, like, try to kill each other. But it, it's if it's not fun, it's funny. But there's also got to be an understanding that we're not there to judge. Right. There's no way that I can ever be better than anyone else. Because the only one that I'm striving to be better about is myself, right? So I try to be authentic. I try to be as human as possible. And yeah, I make mistakes and I will own up to that shit right away. Um, because people, they, they, they um, when you work with uh, people that have lived through so much, survived so much, they, they can see through you. Um, yeah, so the only one you're fooling is yourself when you go in there trying to be the savior, you know? Yeah. I think that's what I liked about Joe Mm -hmm. because Joe knew that, right? Mm -hmm. Joe was, he was a good listener, but he also, you know, he did his best, he he did his best to teach us, to civilize us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because I know that I was really rough around the edges. Yeah. And so we're getting close to time. Marilyn, is there anything else that you want to share before we complete? I think that, um, I think people need to start sitting down with their children and talking to them about, about how to be human with each other. Hmm. Um, Because that's where it comes from. My daughter, my but my daughter, I brought her here and she wanted to die. She encountered so much racism, so much prejudice and discrimination from, from, from the kids her age that she just decided one day she wanted to jump off a bridge. So I think that people need to sit down and talk to their children and, and also be accountable for for the for their judgments you know, for, for, for being that way, because these children are learning from you, mm-hmm. right? They are learning from the adults and what are the adults showing them done on social media? You know, all of those people look at this uh, earthquake happened and, and, and then they showed a, a, a picture of a bunch of flats, like those, those uh, things that, that you store heavy things on. Mm-hmm those wooden panel flaps or whatever. Like, um, like, uh, like containers? Yeah, something like that. They're like wooden pallets, the, the pallets, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I see that on social media, you know, look, there's an earthquake. Someone's, someone's home in 10 city um, is demolished. 
it's going to cost tens of tens of dollars to fix. Hmm. You know, that's a message that our children are seeing. That's a message that all children are seeing. And they will respond accordingly. Whether they are Caucasian, they will side with that. And they will copy it and they will do it. Hmm. You know? And I wouldn't doubt that that there's a, I've, I've encountered a lot of na- youth that are shamed because they're believing in the narrative that we are savages, that we are alcoholics and drug addicts without realizing that there's a history to that. So we gotta, we gotta do better with our children. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Marilyn, for taking the time. Um, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, Marilyn's story can also be read inside of a book. Marilyn, do you wanna tell everybody a little bit about that? Um, so we, we have a, a book, it's, uh, 10 authors who took a chapter each and it's called from shadow to light, uh, the whole, uh, whole human approach to mental health. And that's just some of our trauma stories. Um, for me, it's my life because my whole life is a trauma. <laughs> But I mean, like, I, I try to impart, like, there is, like, I, I came out of it. Yeah. Um, I'm a survivor, and, and I'm, I'm sober. But that, that encases our stories, and how we were able to overcome, overcome it. Um, and it's sold in Amazon, and all the proceeds go to mental health. Okay, so it's called From Shadows to Light. Yeah. A whole human approach to mental health. If you don't add that, then you're, it's going to get lost into a lot of books that are called from shadows to light. Yeah. Uh, and I'll put it in the um, in the notes when I share the video too. So thank you everybody for listening and taking the time to be with us tonight.